Good morning and welcome to the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle Demonstration. Here with me today to talk about the vehicle is Lori Garver, NASA Deputy Administrator, Mark Geyer, Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle Program Manager, and Larry Price, the Orion Deputy Program Manager for Lockheed Martin. We'll have a brief overview and then we'll take questions. Lori? Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to have you here uh, at the Kennedy Space Center, where we are honoring and celebrating over 30 years of a space shuttle program. Uh, looking behind you, we have uh, in just uh, hopefully 24 hours, maybe a few more, uh, going to show the world just what it is that NASA has been doing on behalf of the American taxpayer for the last 30 years, as we have uh, carried unbelievable amounts of satellites, spacecraft, and ultimately building the space station uh, to orbit using our wonderful space shuttle. Today, we're here this morning to talk about the future and what we are doing at NASA when this amazing vehicle, the space shuttle, retires in just a few weeks. I am standing in front of uh, the test article of the Orion MPC vehicle. This vehicle is what is going to allow NASA, on behalf of the American people and the world, to explore again beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, this vehicle is a partnership. NASA uh, is working very closely with our industry team led by Lockheed Martin Corporation. We have just recently looked at the requirements that we have at NASA for this new program that President Obama announced last year, uh, the uh, signing of the authorization bill in 2010 by the President, a bill that was agreed to by both members of Congress, bipartisan support for space exploration, outlined that we would have a multi-purpose crew vehicle on top of a space launch system that will travel first to an asteroid with humans for the first time and beyond to Mars in the mid-2030s. Uh, the President spoke about these goals again just yesterday, and uh, it is with this vehicle that we intend to carry out that mission. We have uh, le looked at, as I said, the requirements for those missions and found that they so well matched with the previous program of Orion under the Constellation system that we are going forward with this vehicle. We uh, look forward to very soon selecting the specific design for the space launch system and uh, being able to go forward and move out in this era of exploration once again on behalf of the American people. I want to first congratulate not only uh, the NASA team, but the Lockheed team. They have worked incredibly well this last uh, more, more than a year of transition. We recognize that the team has found unbelievably creative ways to pull uh, some of the systems that were required previously for Constellation that are not for the new program. We have streamlined activities. They have gotten savings. They can tell you more details about that. But uh, on behalf of Charlie Bolden, the head of NASA, and the whole NASA team, we just could not be prouder of this program. We believe that on behalf of the American people, it is again time for NASA to do the hard thing, to go beyond low Earth orbit. For over 50 years now, we've been transporting people to and from low Earth orbit. We have a program, Commercial Crew, as you know, that will be working with our industry partners to rely on them more, to be contracting in new ways so that they can uh, add their innovative spirit, as uh, Lockheed has helped the government do with this program, to truly, truly be able to commercialize space and open up space for more people and activities. As we lower the costs of getting to and from low Earth orbit through this commercial cargo and crew program, it will allow us to do these more far-reaching programs that NASA was established to do. Again, we couldn't be prouder of the team. I would uh, like to pass this on for more details to our program manager of the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle Team, Mark Geyer. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I, I appreciate everybody for showing up today. It gives us a chance to talk about the work that we're so excited about and talk about something that we think is very important for the United States. Uh, the MPCB Orion system is one of the key systems that can, can keep the United States uh, in front for exploration. 
Uh, it's a system that um, houses the crew when we leave Earth's atmosphere as well as translate to the beyond Earth orbit destinations that we're talking about. It also is the system that houses the crew when we return them safely uh, to the surface of the planet. Uh, the MPCB Orion system enables uh, us to return the crew safely during uh, um, contingencies in any phase of the flight and return them back safely to us, designed from the beginning for people, designed from the beginning for safety. It also is a highly capable system that provides the Delta V and life support and extended duration that, that fits in all the architectures that NASA's talking about and all the destinations that we're looking at. So it's a highly capable system. Um, it's in three, uh, there are three main pieces to the MPCB Orion uh, capsule system. The first is the launch abort system uh, that Larry will talk a little bit about the tests that we've done on that system already. It enables us to get the crew off in an emergency during the early phases of, uh, of ascent. Uh, the crew, crew module is actually obviously where the crew sits. Um, it's where the crew has their living accommodations, where they stow their stuff. It's where they interface with the capsule systems. It also uh, has the seats and parachutes and TPS that allows us to return them safely to the surface. The service module provides the uh, life support and propellant systems to go do those long duration missions as well as power generation and, uh, and the thermal systems. Uh, it's, uh, uh, Lori mentioned everything this team has done. It's a highly integrated team between NASA and Lockheed and industry, I think providing the best expertise from both to tackle this, this uh, difficult challenge. And so I'd like to introduce Larry. He's going to give, us, give you a little bit of background on the status of the, of the program. Again, thank you all for coming here this morning. Uh, Mark, and, Mark and I, our entire teams with Lori, are extremely excited about this program. We have been working on it for some time and, and most recently refining the requirements, as Lori mentioned, and the concept functionality to meet those requirements. And so we're finishing up the design and we're getting elements in test now. As Mark mentioned, we did last year test the launch abort system. This is three solid rocket motors that control the separation of the crew system away from a catastrophe during ascent. Very significant because this vehicle will guide the, guide the crew module directly off uh, from the pad a mile up and a mile away and then return them on the uh, parachutes and the de descent system designed for return from far Earth planets. Uh, so that was successfully done last year. We have the first uh, crew module in acoustic test, environmental test right now, starting tests this month. So that's the first spacecraft that's been fabricated to meet these requirements and the functionality. And it will be going through a series of environmental tests to verify what the environments inside the vehicle are for the crew and all of the mechanical and electrical systems. So we qualify them to the appropriate uh, conditions but not overqualify them where they would get heavy or expensive. So it's a significant development accomplishment that streamlines the process. Um, and we've also got, with that, the, all of the designs have been coming together. We've got the avionics system, the power and communication hardware being assembled with the software operating systems, and they are in, in test today as well. So now with these decisions coming to closure, we've got all these other hardware designs coming together in test so that we'll be ready to meet the requirements of the nation. And, and we too are extremely proud and excited to be part of this collaborative team. Working with NASA, we have uh, over 70 contractors, five significant prime contractors, and it's a relationship where frankly you can't tell who works for who, whether it's a prime contractor or a sub or NASA. It is this team working together to solve the challenge. We'll go ahead and take questions now. Please state your name and affiliation and who you're directing your question to. Who wants to go first? Okay. I'll ask my question first. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Amos, BBC News. Uh, the Europeans are coming to the end of uh, their ATV uh, development. They've got, a, I think, three more vehicles to produce, and then they want to do something else, and they're very keen to get involved in MPCV Orion. I know you've had a couple of discussions with them about that. What exactly could the Europeans do to get involved in this? Okay. Um, so, you know, one of my jobs is to give my boss lots of options. Uh, when we have a, a as Lori said, the budget, uh, we need to be looking at smart ways of doing things, being affordable, and one, one of the things is to look at other opportunities for people providing parts of this system. Um, ESA obviously has capability. They've done things on space station. So we've had very early discussions. I want to characterize that as uh, it's one of the many things we look at to enable uh, flying as early as possible and doing the most um, 
for this country. So it's one of the things we're doing. On, they have some ideas on what they could provide. And so we've had a couple of meetings about what the requirements might be and what the deal might look like. So I would characterize it as very early discussions. What's, what sort of systems could they provide? I mean, well, uh, we, know, we know that they've, you know, you look at ATV and HTV that have flown to space station, they have propulsion, guidance, rendezvous and docking, uh, consumables, those kind of things. They have a lot of experience in those systems. And they've done things on space station, computers and other things that were a big part of space station success. So they obviously have uh, skills. <laughs> They'd be very useful. Uh, thank you. Gene McCulka from Talking Space. Uh, the design of the vehicle is somewhat similar to the old Apollo vehicle. Has any of that data helped you guys out in the design of the vehicle? And have you been collaborating with any of the Apollo folks? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I think what we, the key thing on there is we take the best from what we've learned there and we add the newest technology and the new, our newest experience, all the things we've learned since Apollo on shuttle and everything else and applied it to those systems. A lot, the physics hasn't changed since the 60s, so reentry is the same. So we use the, the databases we've had before and the experience we had before in the design of both the, the shape and the uh, thermal protection system are good examples. Thank you, uh, Tarek Malik with uh, space.com. Um, and I think Mark for you. Um, in the earlier Orion, uh, I guess, process, you had uh, two variants, a four-person and a six-person, uh, depending on what you're going to use it for. I'm just kind of curious which design then you're kind of leaning towards for a deep space. Would you want a four-person, like a more versatile craft? Um, you know, what your, your schedule might be in terms of having to, to down like that so that you can make it meet the uh, space launch system uh, requirements? Yeah, great. Good question. The, it's the same design. The, the, this size, this volume, is what is required for a four-person crew for those longer duration missions. You know, the longer you're in space together, you need more room for stowing equipment, for uh, the bathroom, frankly, for other things, and putting on and off EVA suits. So you need more volume for the longer duration missions. So this volume is appropriate for a four-person mission. If you wanted to, though we don't have a mission for that, if you wanted to do a much shorter duration, you could fit more people into it. Right now, we don't have a mission for that. Seth Bornstein, Associated Press, maybe for Lori. Um, the change from Orion to MCPV, MPCV, can you tell us, besides just the name, what specifics did you change and why, and the cost of it, and especially the cost of just changing the name? I mean, how much are taxpayers paying because you're dumping Orion for MPCV, and how much are these overall changes costing? I'll, I'll let Mark follow up on the details, or Larry, but o overall I would say, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that we looked at the alignment of the requirements for the previous program consolation and for our needs going forward, and found that they were so well aligned that we have chosen the vehicle. Uh, it's interesting you pick on the name. We, I, I see everything says Orion. It's not, it's not clear to me that there, just because it is a multi-purpose crew vehicle, it always was a multi-purpose crew vehicle, uh, we will be looking, I think, as we transition to new programs, what it is uh, that will identify with this vast new exploration program we have, but uh, naming is not really something that we've been hung up on in any way. We're happy, happy to be with the Orion team here and uh, just clarifying because the law, the actual law said we would develop a multi-purpose crew vehicle. I don't think the law meant to name something uh, just to describe it. And uh, overall, I would say while we have somewhat in my view Granted, I wasn't here at the time, so I could be corrected. Gone back to the original purpose of Orion. Orion's original purpose was for deep space exploration, was not intended to go to the space station. We had hoped to have uh, the commercial vehicles more advanced at that time. Funding was not available. We did not start funding the crew program yet. And so Orion was going to be making detour to the space station on its way. It's, it was set to do deep space, and in fact, much, much overbuilt for the space station mission and overqualified. Uh, we certainly all uh, recognize that if needed, we would do that. It is in the law that it is a backup, but we really believe that if you are spending all your money doing that, you are not going to be going further, which is what the American taxpayer and the president have uh, asked us to do. So just in terms of the changes, though, I mean, you're... So we... Uh, 
You know, I don't know that we've spent 20 bucks on the name. I think Lori said it very well. We're going to do that prudently. We're going to make sense. We're going to make sure we do what makes sense. And we're we're using Orion today. We have not changed our documents and those kind of things. We'll work with headquarters to see what makes sense. But right now, we haven't done that. No reason to yet. Um, I think the I think the key thing is what you said is we know we recognize the budget challenges these days. And I think Lori said it very well. This team has done a great job. I think of getting down to what is essential relative to design and test and fabrication uh, on this vehicle. And uh, we've cut a lot of costs out overhead and other things to get down to, I think, provide the best capability for the country. So that's what I focus on. In the last few years, we, I think we've done a great job in concert with headquarters on finding a lot of efficiencies. So. Hey, Alex Kirst, NHK. Um, so I heard you guys um, talking a little bit before about safety. Safety is the name of the game certainly now. Can you tell us what, if anything, specifically encourages you about this vehicle vis-a-vis -vis the space shuttle? Well, let's see. I'd say a couple of things. The mission itself, uh, given that we have the crew separate from the large cargo, enables us to have an abort capability through all phases of flight. I think that's a fundamental difference. So that's why the launch abort system is so important during ascent. Uh, uh, we're going to have a great rocket, I know, but there, there are still things that happen. And even when those unlikely things happen, we're going to be able to get the crew off. And we showed that in the pad abort one test, that we have a highly capable system. The other thing I think also that maybe people don't know is we have a capability, contingency capability, actually return from these uh, deep space missions, even in, a, even in a depressed condition where the cabin is depressed. This system is built to return that crew over extended duration and get them back on the surface of the Earth. So there's things like that that we thought from the beginning through the whole mission of how to uh, uh, handle contingencies and get the crew safely back. So I think those are some big differences. Anything else about yeah. maybe the simplicity of the craft yeah. that might also contribute yeah. to it? Yeah, so the question was simplicity of the craft. So really from, you know, 100 years of flight, 50 years of space, we've been leveraging all of the lessons learned in space to apply it to the principal design, to simplify the design so it would avoid those failure modes. And then as Mark is mentioning, then, then we make those systems that you still have to have robust. In addition to the obvious systems that, that Mark pointed out, We've got a redundancy in other components, and then even redundancy that's intended to be a different backup, so we don't have what you call common mode failures. So taking all the lessons learned from human space flight, aircraft flight, even NASCAR, we participate in design of NASCAR race cars that can run into the wall at 200 miles an hour. Apply that to materials technology. So when space program started, NASA was, was beginning all of this work. Now we've got the opportunity to leverage the rest of the industry and apply it back into the system. So it's a collaboration of both. The avionics system is a good example. It's derived from uh, uh, computers that are flying airliners today. So this is really the sixth generation of a fault tolerant hardware and software system that we're getting thousands of hours of test time every day that NASA's not paying for. The commercial airlines are, ex are testing those systems for us all the time. So we're leveraging all of those systems to make it just inherently safer. Hi, Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine for NASA and Lockheed. Can you talk about when you will launch humans into space and the flight test program leading up to that, and when will NASA pick a rocket to do that flight test, those initial flight tests, which I think are in 2013? Thank you. Well, we, uh, as I said in the opening remarks, are very close to selecting a specific design uh, for the rocket, and as we do that, we will be laying out the test flight program. This is a constrained budget environment, however, and some of the test flight dates that you mentioned are uh, things that would have been uh, uh, possible on uh, the authorization levels that are significantly higher than both what we received for 11 and not only what our request is for 12, but what the appropriators have just outlined, at least in the House, would be uh, for 12. So those test flights, uh, we are looking at now what that schedule would be and hoping to be able to uh, make our final determination on the designs and get it announced on the SLS uh, very soon. Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. Just to follow up, Lori, does that mean that you're not going to fly Orion on um, uh, another launch vehicle besides SLS? Have you made that decision? 
The, the program has made uh, recommendations about that. I think until our final uh, vehicles are sele selected, unless I'm wrong, we aren't ready to announce those decisions. But the constrained fiscal environment does cause us to really look at test flights. And then, of course, also with what we choose for the SLS will depend. If there are things that are more readily available, and those would work in a way that would not only then test the uh, crew vehicle, but part of the rocket as well, that would clearly uh, possibly be a more efficient way to do it. Where is the SLS decision at this point? Uh, the SLS decision, we are looking at all the cost evaluation. We have an independent cost evaluation coming through, and uh, we still hope to be able to announce, I think, by the end of the summer. Uh, Jim Siegel with the Celebration Independent Newspaper. Um, there are, uh, you, you mentioned earlier, Lori, about the constrained budget situation that the country faces right now. So how would you answer uh, those who would question uh, why should we be spending uh, this money uh, today for deep, deep space exploration? I mean, besides just being first, what, what's in it for the taxpayer? Thank you. I guess I challenge uh, folks who believe that we shouldn't be spending money on space to recognize that all this money is spent here on Earth, that every penny of the taxpayers' dollars that has been spent toward NASA and these unbelievable programs has gone to jobs in this country, folks who have uh, developed technologies who have then come off and developed new markets uh, and created even more jobs to help our economic growth. The aerospace industry is still one of the last remaining export industries in this nation that has created unbelievable uh, wealth and growth for our country. In addition, the leadership of great nations explore. This is what we do as a nation. We in the United States are explorers. We can't wait to get back to exploration beyond low Earth orbit, but I would challenge you to say that we are exploring on the International Space Station. The space shuttle has been an exploring vehicle. It's a little tough to have people believe we're trapped in low Earth orbit when we realize how amazing it is to be able to get there with this vehicle uh, that we will hopefully be launching tomorrow. The International Space Station is developing not only the types of technologies and information we no need for NASA to go further. We are developing technologies that are used right here on planet Earth through medical technologies, uh, materials. We, uh, we have made advancements in uh, computer technology, miniaturization from the space program that has led to the innovation that has made this country great. NASA is that very, very small part of the government funding that is an investment in our future and through developments in aeronautics, earth sciences, the ability to have satellites that are gonna help us determine what it is in store for our planet in the future, you cannot put a price on that. And I can't complete my answer without talking about the fact that NASA was born of the Cold War, won the Cold War, has opened up the world for this peaceful, cooperative relationship we have with the former Soviet Union. While we don't want to count on the Soyuz, the Russian vehicle, for our transportation services any longer than we have to, the fact that we have this partnership with Russia that has allowed us to work together peacefully, how can you put a price tag on that? That is what NASA has given to the world. And it's a privilege to be part of the group that has done it. And uh, while we spent 4% of the budget during Apollo, we do it for less than half a percent now. And uh, the men and women of NASA, the contractor team, university team, have been doing this so that we, our children, our grandchildren, can have a better future. It's uh, nothing short of, in my view, the very best investment that the taxpayer makes uh, in, the, in the country. Could I try to add just a little bit, Lori? So, so we do this because we're engineers and we love building these marvelous machines and the people we deal with. But the flight test article, we transported it from California recently so we can use it in production pathfinder testing today. But we had the opportunity to make a few stops across the country. And I participated in the stop in Austin. And in two days they had 10,000 people just stop by the vehicle in Austin. They just wanted to touch it. 
They just wanted to hear that we were doing, that we were doing this as a country, going on and exploring. And, and they had no vested interest right in Austin. They were just excited about it. So I think the grassroots, everyone we talk to, children and youth that are excited about being astronauts, are coming up to us every day and want to participate. NASA has high school interns that are participating in this program that are excited. They participated in the, the Rendezvous and Proxop demo on the last shuttle flight. High school kids that are sitting on console during the summer. And the Congress, you all know, is very supportive of it. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, the economy is tight. But the spin-offs and the inspiration that this creates is phenomenal. Any more questions? Yeah, hi, Mike Wall from space.com. Um, so, so yeah, people, people are used to seeing the space shuttle as sort of, I mean, our iconic space vehicle for this country. And this, I mean, it looks back, like it, like it seems like we're sort of going back in time with this design. And so, I uh, guess, what would you say to folks who, who would say, well, this, this looks like old technology. It looks like, I don't know, 60s era technology. How has it sort of been adapted for the 21st century? And also, do you guys have any plans to, to sort of give this uh, like, I don't know, could it actually land on an asteroid, this vehicle? Or, I mean, do you have any plans to actually put that capability in sometime? Yeah, so I think, you know, part of it is, again, the physics doesn't change. So you have to look beyond the shape uh, to understand the technology that's in this vehicle. So as Larry mentioned before, we've used the state of the art in other industries. So we're not starting from the beginning and then accelerated it and added the capabilities we need to do this deep space mission. So it is advanced technology for the, for the thermal protection system, the launch abort system, the avionics, uh, all the life support systems that are part of keeping the crew alive are not systems that we pull from Apollo, obviously, right? This is stuff we've learned from Apollo, advanced in both other industries as well as the shuttle and now applied to this system. Um, as far as the, the, the NEO missions, there are other capabilities you could do as we get close to the NEOs. There's a couple of ways where you could actually get to the surface. Uh, EVAs or another vehicle that would allow the crew to, to descend down to the surface. You wouldn't actually dock uh, with this particular vehicle. But this gets them there and allows them to get home. I'll mention uh, the iconic image of the space shuttle and I do believe it is something that the public has related to similar to sort of that footprint on the moon. And uh, we'll have flying vehicles with wings in the future. We'll have footprints on the moon in the future. But this is using what we've learned, one of the earlier uh, responses to the question about why uh, this vehicle is safer and why we're more, we're more uh, comfortable with it than the space shuttle is. You know, Apollo was the way it was for a reason. This is going into deep space. The shuttle could not do that. And in fact, the uh, possibilities of being able to escape at any moment are something that we just need to require. We learn that uh, we shouldn't be carrying the large uh, payloads with the crew, as was a CABE recommendation. These are things we put into place. So yes, we will always have the shuttle iconic image. We, we really need to recognize the space station is an iconic image. I know we don't see it physically as uh, it launches and lands, as it did that in pieces. But I don't know, I assume all of you, like, like me, do track it and go overnight and see that uh, beautiful bright object in the sky go overhead uh, and recognize we have women and men living in space permanently. We are spacefaring civilization. And uh, with this vehicle, it is going to allow us to continue uh, to explore. I'm waiting. I'm Bill Cap. All right, there we go. I'm Bill Capo from WWL-TV in New Orleans. And uh, my guy has had a little trouble getting uh, in position. I'm waiting for a second for him to get in position. That, of course, is where the external tank. There we go. This, New Orleans is where the external tanks have been built. And there's a lot of uh, angst and concern in New Orleans about what the future of space flight is. Uh, we've run into people here uh, who helped build those tanks who are very worried. Uh, you can see he's getting his microphone in place. Um, they're, they're very worried about what the next step will be and whether New Orleans will have a role in that. So, so what can you tell the people of New Orleans about what their future might be in the space exploration race. The women and men who have worked on the space shuttle program in New Orleans, in Houston, in Cocoa Beach, and Titusville area have put their hearts and soul into a vehicle and should be nothing but proud of the accomplishment. We plan a very robust future for 
not only human spaceflight, but NASA generally, that will take all the contributions of uh, these people. Investing in those technologies and those programs that can help lower the costs and be more efficient are what are going to continue to create more jobs and keep aerospace industry on the cutting edge to keep us from just having only government-funded programs that we know are not only limited, but maybe not even growing, uh, as, uh, of course, we would all hope. We absolutely recognize that Michoud, uh capabilities across the country have uh, unique aspects of them that we want to take advantage of the future programs, whether there are aspects of the SLS that will do that specifically in, in New Orleans, future commercial vehicles I know are looking at the facility. Uh, those are all potential for uh, that facility, but I guess I, I would also just add, I mean, we know we owe what we have with the shuttle program to the folks at Michoud. Never forget those uh, people who rode out the hurricane and literally saved the space station, space shuttle, the human space flight program, and have allowed us to do all of this. I have a son who's uh, spent his first year in college, and I know people feel like the shuttles are like children. And it's hard when they go away and you feel a little sad at first. And um, some days you're a little relieved and they made it and you're proud. Mainly you're proud. And that's what people should feel about this program and recognize that uh, by their achievements, they're gonna allow us to do even more and we want all of their participation. And you can come visit them and uh, we'll get you a, a nice oyster po' boy or crawfish uh, jambalaya. We do, uh, of course, we do weld the Orion system at Mishu, and we take the experience. We've got a lot of experienced people from ET that were applied to that job, so they're a key part of our structural work. Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. Uh, Laurie, I just want to follow up a little bit about your answer on the SLS system. You said by the end of the summer. Um, you know that you're under a certain amount of pressure from Congress to, to have produced that already. Um, and it's also my understanding that the administrator has picked the reference design for the vehicle and forwarded it to the White House for uh, consideration. So could you maybe break it out a little bit more about where that decision is and exactly when, or at least a little bit more precisely, when we can expect to see it? Well, we actually picked a reference design uh, vehicle, I think, as you know, in the report to Congress in January. We have been working to respond to this final uh, decision that came out about a month ago? Well, it turns out that the administration makes these decisions and there is not a final decision. Uh, if you look historically at how uh, we have made these decisions, I look back to the very space shuttle program and the administration looks very, very closely at getting the right design that we know when we put it forward is affordable and sustainable. Uh, we have absolutely a reference design that we are looking at very closely that as we look at the costs and the independent cost assessment, we will be ready to announce. And, and where in the administration is we looking at it? Which part of the administration? We're, we're one team in our administration. Uh, Leo Enright uh, with Irish Television. Uh, we had a look yesterday at the SpaceX vehicle, the, uh, the small capsule that they, they've developed. Uh, can you describe for a layperson where these two vehicles fit in evolutionary terms, rather like the T-shirt that shows Homo sapiens? I mean, can you, can you place these two vehicles on that evolutionary chart? I can... Uh, I I'm I less compared to evolution than those types of technologies that once you develop them become operational while you still develop the next. So if we are looking at things we've done for 50 years, which is go to and from low Earth orbit, uh, launching people and things, we know that we have uh, for decades now done that with the private sector. We have paid the private sector to launch a satellite. We now intend to pay the private sector to launch crew. Same thing that we've done in the past. At NASA, we have developed new vehicles that are going further and that are 
putting in the new technology that we have developed through these investments in order to do the cutting edge exploration. That is, is Orion. That is the difference. When I said it uh, would be uh, overbuilt and overqualified for the station mission, it can do the station mission. It is simply something that would cost much more to do, and so you'd rather have that in an efficient way. NASA has spent uh, nearly a third of our budget on space transportation to and from lower Earth orbit. If you spent a third of your budget on your car, you would have a very difficult time balancing your budget or doing uh, new things. So we are just looking to do those things that have broader markets that we have done for a longer period of time. We have used this model for our launch industry, communication satellite industry, many types of space have been now operated by the private sector and we just buy the service. Uh, that is our, our uh, model for commercial low earth orbit and NASA intends to, with our industry partners Lockheed, go beyond with this vehicle. Could, could I maybe be more blunt and say that uh, the people in SpaceX talk about taking their vehicle to Mars, so why is the government building a vehicle? NASA looked very closely, as I uh, told you, to look at our requirements for these deep space vehicles, and we determined that they are, in fact, different enough than the capability we require on the space station to invest in a different vehicle. Now, absolutely in the future, I know Charlie Bolden has said this, we do our first uh, uh, test flights and missions with this, we could compete for a deep space vehicle, and, and, uh, and Orion could compete, and if someone evolves another vehicle, that could, could uh, be in, in a future. We truly believe at this point there is not another market for a human mission to an asteroid uh, or Mars, uh, probably not even the moon at this point, but I absolutely hope and believe there will be in the future. We paved the way. Well, this is the Lewis and Clark mission. You know, certainly folks went after. That's the whole goal. Uh, and we I hope our partners at SpaceX can be successful along with the other competitors in order to bring down this cost and then allow us to go uh, further. We, we want all of these industry partners. I think it's one of the most exciting things about the future. We're a capitalist society. We're a nation that loves the competition. I remember Norm Augustine saying, uh, you know, I know we like to cooperate, but uh, how many people go to the all-star game as compared to the Super Bowl? So we're going to harness that, that spirit and have a competition for uh, the low Earth orbit portion. As we go on, we hope there'll be future competitions. Uh, the very first question was about international partnership and what they could add specifically to this. And while I wanted Mark to answer the specifics of it, I do want to be clear, the national space policy is extremely forward-leaning on working with our international partners as we go further and explore. We believe that exploration is uh, not only an American dream, but a human drive of our spirit. And we believe that as we go, uh, not only to the asteroid mission, but to Mars, that we will be doing that uh, with international partners. That's all the time we have. Um, the next event on NASA TV will be the Countdown Status Briefing at 10 a.m. For more information, go to www.nasa.gov. Thank you for joining us.